you. And uh, my appreciation to the ACCJ and to all of you for, uh, is that okay? Okay. So my appreciation to the ACCJ uh, and to all of you for attending this today. I have to say there's nothing more that focuses the mind than hearing that there's a survey shortly after this speech. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. <laughs> all right, so we're going to talk to you today a little bit about um, cities. Um, why cities? Why now? Uh, cities matter. They are the flag carriers, if you will, for nations in many instances. They are the places uh, which tend to be the centers of innovation, of ideas, of societal and cultural in, uh, uh, influence. They are also the, the places where I think both tourism and inward investment for business connects as well. They are incredibly important. What I think is equally important is that we've kind of moved from this position of talking about cities as places. I very much look at cities about being experiences. And because they are experiences, they are in that sense brands. They need to be managed in that way, particularly in a place like Tokyo, which obviously we're now increasingly focused on what's happening, not just in 2020, but also beyond as well. I'm going to talk to you a little bit um, about uh, some work that Weber Shamrock has completed recently about a, an engaging cities report where we uh, looked at eight different cities across Asia Pacific. I'll also make some comments too about some uh, similar research, um, uh, but obviously particularly interested in looking at the attributes of why Tokyo is such an engaging place. I, am, I also want to uh, thank, before we do start, um, uh, our panel guests today, we've got uh, Dr. Richard Kawa uh, joining us from the uh, Mori Foundation, uh, David Agnelli from uh, IDEO, uh, and also uh, Dr. Nancy Snow as well from um, California State University. Let me start with this point, and it's this fact. By the time we get to 2030, 60% of the world's population will live in cities. That means a lot of things. It means living and working and communicating and engaging with people who live in those cities is about to get more and more complicated. But I think it's important to, to note that of all the cities in Asia that are forecasting significant population growth, Tokyo actually appears to be going the other direction. Whatever numbers you believe, about 37 million people live here at the moment, and I think by 2030 it's about forecast to be about 36. The challenge, then, for Tokyo is not necessarily how it manages population growth, but how it manages the competitive nature of those cities that crave the talent, the creative talent, that allows cities to deal with the issues of population growth. This is a city which many of you live and work in, which is renowned for its creative talent. I believe that what Tokyo now faces is a challenge for that talent that is perhaps unprecedented. With our own work, um, we um, took a look at, as I said, at eight different cities, and we were looking at the impact of soft power uh, attributes uh, on the uh, reputation of those cities, and particularly what civic leaders and brands needed to do uh, to help manage that. We were looking at 16 different soft power attributes. And when I talk about soft power, I guess I mean anything that's not economic, political, or military. They range, as you can see, from everything from tourism through to retail, um, um, social media, etc., etc. And we wanted to understand how cities performed uh, against these metrics. We interviewed about 4,200 people, 4,157, I think, to be precise. Uh, and we were asking them about their perception of cities and how they performed against these attributes. I'll just share with you for a moment what we found from that because, well, I think it's kind of interesting. Hong Kong performed well, um, and it continues in Asia to be perceived as the strongest hub for finance. It retains that, uh, that position. But I think what's interesting 
in about Hong Kong is what we saw uh, in areas of creativity. There are specific initiatives that the government is undertaking to ensure that the creative classes, if we want to call it that, are not being pushed out of the center of cities on account of the, the cost of living. There are designated areas of low rent um, which, in which the creative classes, everything from architects through to probably PR executives, are able to actually um, uh, uh, work and operate. I think this is a really important thing to consider. It's not about how we just retain creative talent, it's how we, cr we retain that talent within the heart and hub of the city. Tokyo is very much positioned as being an innovative hub. That's uh, you know, what a lot of, of, of people involved in the perception management of the city focus on. Tokyo is an innova innovation hub. We need to ensure that the innovators live and work in the city, not just necessarily on the periphery of it. What else? Seoul, I guess, was, it was interesting for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, it's very much considered to be the youth city of Asia. It's this sort of 360 experience, this immersive experience. When I talk about cities as, as, as experiences, Seoul represents this like no other. What was interesting, too, is that we also found um, that Seoul had the lowest self-esteem rating of any cities um, assessed. And that means that whilst all residents of all cities considered their city to be better, a better performer against these attributes, it was the folks who, came, who lived and worked in Seoul that actually uh, saw themselves, I guess, at a, at a lower level. They, uh, they have a, an extraordinary sense of modesty. Um, so too, I should add, does Tokyo. Uh, as someone who lives in Sydney, I can confirm that Sydney has the highest level of self-confidence <laughs> <laughs> by about 25 percentage points. Um, and uh, yeah, it's absolutely right as well. Um, what about some of these other markets? Uh, Shanghai was interesting. With Shanghai, as a, as a, if we were to index these cities against each other, kind of sat very much in the middle in perception. There was a sense that the... Uh, I talk about this in a diplomatic fashion, but there was a sense that the strength and rapid growth of, um, of Shanghai, and particularly, I think, also the uh, mobility of Chinese, uh, some people, or certainly our respondents, felt almost found that to be an imposition. There was a sense of, of growing dominance. There was almost a, a sense of nervousness about what Shanghai was, uh, uh, was doing which I thought was kind of interesting. Singapore, likewise, is interesting. Um, it's challenged by geography. Uh, I think it is recognized, certainly, as, as a, a city that is ingenious. What it does really well, however, is it has a very, very clear city brand strategy in a way I don't think that any other city has. Now, perhaps it can do that because it's a city-state, unlike, obviously, a Tokyo as compared to Japan. But it has this program that some of you may have heard of called In 2015. And In 2015 was devised about six or seven years ago. And it, it, what it does, it puts innovation and creativity at the hub of Singapore's strategy. Everything that city does, whether it be from its flag carrier airlines, Singapore Airlines, to Changi Airport, through to investments in research and R&D, is very much anchored in innovation and creativity. Now, that I think is important because it prevents or presents consistency in the way in which that particular city brand projects itself on the world and how it influences its position. Having a very clear city brand strategy which connects tourism, investment, aviation, research, education, healthcare, etc., is essential. What else do we see? Um, well, Sydney, um, it's a beautiful place. There's no doubt about that. But there's almost this sense that sometimes beauty gets in the way of things. Um, it's a place that doesn't use it na its neighbourhoods particularly well. Sydney is the central, it's the CBD, it's the central business district. There was a sense of non-representation or understanding of what actually went on about 300 yards outside of the Sydney Opera House. And I think Sydney has a huge task to to address um, after the glow of the 2000 Olympics is beginning to fade. Tokyo has much to learn from what's happened in Sydney 
in the last 15 years. A lot of good things have happened in Sydney, um, particularly around environment, perhaps strangely enough. It's highly regarded in sports and infrastructure. It caps number one in this particular ranking. Where it fell away, where it was actually last against all of our eight cities, uh, and I, I'm not talking about Kuala Lumpur and Bangkok here, although they were included, was somewhat bizarrely in food and dining experiences. Any of you who actually have been to Sydney will know that it has an exceptional food and dining experience, but it hasn't told that story until perhaps recently with Tourism Australia's Restaurant Australia campaign. I'm not sure whether that was that was seen here, but you know this this ability of uh, the beauty of Sydney is perhaps sometimes gets in the way. So what about your own city? What about the city of Tokyo? Um, Perhaps you'll be pleased to know that the, r the respondents ranked Tokyo number one in 10 of those 16 soft power attributes, in 10 of them. It's considered to be globally an extraordinarily creative city. But you know what's really interesting about this, I would suggest to you, is that it's almost as if people who live here don't see it. You don't actually s see or sense the strength, the brand strength that this city has. And as a consequence of that, I think we see that perhaps through the, the, the levels of modesty that, came, that um, came through on this. The other significant challenge that Tokyo has, and this is something that um, a whole range of government departments and others, uh, are, I think, are grappling with, is this issue of what happens when you are recognized for being so unique so authentic, such a compelling place to be, and yet there is almost a sense of imbalance when it comes to accessibility. People's ability to connect, not just through infrastructure and transport, but very much at a cultural level. Our friends at um, Mori um, uh, run a, a fascinating report, the Global Power City Index, and we'll talk a little bit about some of that, the specifics with Dr. Ichikawa a little bit later. But it fundamentally measures cities against those six different areas, um, e economy, R&D, et cetera, et cetera. Tokyo performs well. It's uh, num ranked number four in that index over the course of the last, uh, over this year. But the thing is, it's ranked number four for the last eight years. It hasn't moved. And Singapore and Seoul are catching up fast. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a challenge here we think, or certainly I should say Mori thinks, that that challenge sits right in the middle of that particular chart around cultural interaction. Now, there's some points up there that we'll talk in some detail, but if you just look at that central column around weaknesses compared to the top three cities in the world, Paris, London, and New York, the cultural piece is the thing that stands out. That's the bit that we are grappling with, that I think this, this city is grappling with that challenge of finding a balance between attracting tourists. You've had extraordinary explosion in tourism growth. As Ruthie said, you know, how do you deal with 82 million tourists coming at you over the course of the next few years? But how do you do that in a way where a, a willingness to embrace those from overseas is sometimes, sometimes perceived to be lacking? I want to make a couple of final points, um, particularly specific to the Olympics. Um, because, of course, you know, particularly once we got through Rio 2016, it's going to be a huge focus of attention here. In 2011, Britain, UK, my home country, launched a campaign called Great Britain. Uh, it was launched at uh, very end of 2011 in the lead up to the London Olympics. And it was designed to bring in one billion pounds worth of investment through to business and an additional four million tourists, which I believe it achieved. What I think is really interesting about this campaign is perhaps twofold. First and foremost is the clear integration between the investment body, the British Council, um, and also the tourism body as well. They worked incredibly well together to create this central campaign called Great Britain. Britain is great. The other really important thing, which I think is relevant for those of you who work for consumer-facing brands here, is the fact that ultimately 
the Great Britain campaign was successful because it was up consumer brands and well-recognized individuals who were telling the Great Britain story. It, wasn't, it was a government-driven initiative, but they weren't the storytellers. Business was the storytellers. And it resonated incredibly well. And I think without you know, making grand and glib strategies, there's something here that any city that hosts or is expecting to host an Olympic Games may be able to learn from is the way in which you get others to tell your own story rather than necessarily just telling that story itself. I want to make two or three final points um, about what we call a playbook, and that was really looking at what Tokyo particularly does so well. What do great city brands do? Well, first and foremost, they ensure they have their own identity. This is where Kuala Lumpur in this report fell down. It, it, there's very little definition between Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia. So people can't see the difference between them. In Tokyo, there absolutely is. But it's a subtle difference. The difference between perhaps mastery on one hand at a city level and artisanship, perhaps, at a national level. There's subtleties. But when cities have their own identities that give them the chance to perhaps springboard from a national country brand index, it's really important. Future Brand, a sister agency of ours, produces a brand called a, 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 a report called the Country Brand Index. And there was a piece in there which I thought was particularly interesting when it looked at um, index and ranking in 2010. In 2010, the FIFA World Cup was held in South Africa. But in the same year, the Winter Olympic Games was held in Vancouver, in Canada. In the subsequent index, country brand index in 2013, South Africa plummeted. Canada went through the roof. Awareness is not enough. Olympic Games put a spotlight on a city. They put a spotlight on a country as well. And that city and country needs to be very, very clear in the story that it wants to tell. This is something I think that, si that um, Tokyo and all international cities do extremely well, and that is tell their stories through their neighborhoods, through the experiences, as I said earlier about cities' experiences, through the experiences that people expect to have. New York is a typical example from whether it's Soho or whether it's Upper East Side or wherever it may be. Likewise with London, you know, Knightsbridge, Hampstead. We, we kind of, most of us have heard about these sorts of places and we associate a certain experience with those places. I think that's the case too with Tokyo. It's certainly something that great city brands do well. I talked a little bit about the creative classes. This is an absolute must. This is the, the, the hidden challenge, I think, for, for this particular city is how you retain that talent. It makes an enormous difference to a strength of a city brand. So too does people power. And people power is about the experience that, that those of us who don't live in a place have on account of not something that is created or crafted, but simply the experience of engaging with people in a particular city. The service experience from the point where you arrive at an airport through a point where you actually come back through that airport it's, it, itself. And the final point that I want to make um, today is this piece. We call it citizen advocacy. I was talking to somebody earlier about the, the fact is, is that when we live in a city, we sometimes can be quick to criticize. We criticize sometimes about transport systems or people or noisy neighbors or whoever it may be. But I can assure you that what happens across all of the cities that we looked at is that as soon as a resident leaves that city, they can become the biggest advocate of that place. And right now, people are more mobile than they ever have been. When I talk about the success of the Great Britain campaign through business telling stories, I think there's an enormous opportunity for all cities to ensure that their story is told through their own people. And giving them the means and tools to do that is something that needs to very much be on the radar um, of, um, of civic leaders. So I'm going to close at that particular point, about two minutes over time so far. Um, and um, we, I know we're going to turn to our channel. Channel, did you want to say a few words? Or are you 
I can do ahead and invite them through again. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now um, is uh, we have people far more eminent than myself to talk about this. I've simply become the guy who asked the questions, which is great. But I'm looking forward to a very interesting um, discussion. So can I ask you please to welcome Dr. Yoshikawa, Nancy Snow, and David Agnelli up to the table. Okay, so what we're going to do, if we'll take about um, 30 minutes or so just to run through the views of the panel on some of the things that we've talked about and a range of other areas. As I've said, they have all in their own way uh, very much focus on this area of brand um, and um, all of them live and work in Tokyo, uh, whether it be full-time or uh, part-time, as it were. Um, after 30 minutes or so, we'll then open the floor up to, uh, to questions um, for those of you who... Uh, an urgent inquiry, and we'll di direct those to any of the panel. So, um, Dr. Uchikawa, I might start with you, if I may. You look surprised. <laughs> um, and that's just to talk, perhaps, uh, and embellish a little bit more about the um, Global Power City Index. Um, you've been doing this now for eight years. Can you tell us a little bit, maybe, about some of the, the shifts or changes that you have seen over that eight-year period, maybe particularly in relation to, um, to Tokyo? Well, uh, actually, it's been already about the question of Tokyo now. Uh, Tokyo has a fourth position last, f first last eight years. And in this GPCI ranking system, we are trying to find a comprehensive power of the city. But until that time, I know we have many kind of uh, rankings, such as a business center or a financial center. But in this ranking, we are trying to find uh, a comprehensive power by using six important urban functions. And uh, in this ranking, we, we found several things. First of all, in the top four cities, has a very you know, stable positions. Of course, some changes the position there, but uh, it's different from other secondary group. And uh, also, the uh, uh, in 2012, uh, well, New York was placed by London. But anyway, still we keep four cities. And uh, this is our first topic. But second topic is, even so that in the second group, several uh, kind of uh, cities who has a very high speed of economy, rapid of economy growth, uh, such kind of city has a very good position now. The typical uh, case is uh, Chinese cities, mm. such as Beijing, and uh, uh, Shanghai. So this might be a very important topic for the next five to 10 years. Whenever any kind of power of uh, this kind of uh, new wave, I mean just especially focusing on the economic growth, uh, still it has a very good position. Because the other part, within the six functions, five functions, of course, we have, but not so different, but only for one point. For economic growth is a very important issue. And maybe I have to say one more thing about a very good or a very uh, special impact, such as international events, like Olympic Games or Expos. So the typical you know, uh, uh, phenomenon happened in the case of London. Yeah. Uh, London had a very good position now because of Olympic Games. So this is my understanding is uh, any city has to do or has to do something to change something next. Mm. This is my impression. Mm. That's my first topic. Action, yes. Okay. Um, I, one of the points I touched on was this challenge that perhaps Tokyo faces on how, as people become more familiar in it, with it, as they become more interested in the lead up to the, to the games, there'll be this sense of you know, wanting to know more uh, wanting to experience what's unique, and yet perhaps frustration as well about uh, an ability to navigate the city, the experience of the city. I'm interested in your views on, on how a city like Tokyo might be able to manage that balance. What, what does it need to do to ensure it retains what's so 
exciting and compelling about it, and yet ensure that people have a wonderful experience when they're here? Well, there might be so many topics about that, okay? <laughs> when you say a word of uh, balance, we have to say it's a very important topic now. Okay, we have 35 million here. It's a kind of a very exceptional city in the world. Yeah. Uh, it's a first you know, topic for the history because we are just uh, started about urban planning, but about, uh, let's say, uh, 10 million, uh, 50 million, just the uh, maximum. But the 35 is already, you know, uh, extraordinary topic. When I can see the other cities, uh, New York has only uh, 23, and London has only uh, 16 million. So first of all, how we can manage this kind of, you know, unbelievable area? This one topic anyway. But anyway, your question is different from that, okay? Uh, Japanese are very shy. It's Japanese culture. And of course, we have something. But we are very, you know, uh, I have to say, kind of fail. We fail to say something more to the world. But even so that, this Olympic Games, is very good, important, and a good chance to say that. So now we have to think what kind of topic we have to say to the world. This is our you know, task now. My so I'm interested in this, and maybe Nancy, I <coughs> might turn to you on this because I'm not I'm shy. No, I appreciate that, <laughs> um, but modest, I believe. I think um, just sort of picking up on this point about okay, there's understanding that maybe you know we there's a there's a need for people in Tokyo or willingness to to say more, to be more confident. But clearly, I mean, that's a that's a cultural leap as well to be able to do that. So what are your thoughts on you know, how do we ensure that any story that's told is not perhaps contrived? How do we retain that, that authenticity? I would agree with what was said earlier, and that is you don't want to oversell mm. what is so special about Tokyo. I mean, I made a joke about I'm not shy. I'm very much who I am, but I can still uh, get around in a city of 35 million and feel like it's a small town. It becomes very accessible very quickly and you meet people constantly. You talk about creative types. It's so stimulating to the brain. I mean, this is why I'm Professor Emeritus because last year I decided I'd rather live in Tokyo in gorgeous Southern California, and I'd been there 14 years. And it just gets inside of you. And my worry with city branding is that we've got sort of a best kept secret going on here, and it's related to the modesty. And so if Tokyo were to get into this competitive city branding, it's not its natural style to do that. So you have to maneuver this work with the residents, their perception of what Tokyo is, also with the visitors. And in the research, we talk about the difference between, of course, the perception and reality. There's always an anticipation of what that city will be. Sometimes you have no idea about it, but the energy here is extraordinary, and, and people uh, everybody in this room is probably here because it would be a hard place to leave. That's, those are the cities that end up in those reports. And by the way, I'm coming from Beijing and Seoul today, so I'm, I've got all these ideas in my head about how Tokyo compares to those places. And uh, the uh, airport in Seoul is outstanding. The youth culture is something. But it is Tokyo, the management of 35 million, how well it works, is a story in itself. And I would just ask people to tell it, but to tell it in that style of communication that we have grown to really appreciate here, the presentation, which is refreshing in an age of globalization. Mm. Yeah, David, you, you mean your own thoughts on maybe this issue of city as a, as a, a resilient uh, uh, Tokyo is a resilient city, you know. I mean, we've seen in, in the Mori report, Seoul and Singapore beginning to sort of take its own place, um, becoming increasingly recognized as international city, as a city. Do you, do you have a view that Tokyo can learn from what other cities are, are, are doing? Yeah, I think, I think absolutely. I think that 
um, city especially when it comes to soft powers have a lot to learn from one another and I think even just a report like this really highlights things it raises that awareness and you suddenly think oh I could really learn something from Seoul I could really learn something from Singapore and to me maybe a more kind of qualitative perspective I spend a fair amount of time in who well, I've been spending a fair amount of time in both cities uh, what strikes me about Seoul is that it's its speed its boldness I think everything is accessible 24-7 and I know that there's a really kind of charming quality of Tokyo being a little bit calmer, but there's also an expectation that Tokyo is this metropolis where you can do everything at all times. And I think everybody in this room knows that it's not true. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool that about Seoul that you can eat, shop, get a haircut 24 seven. And I think that's, that's really interesting and something that I believe Tokyo should find the right compromise between its pace and its ability to be accessible 24 seven. Mm. Maybe Singapore, I would say very different. I think Singapore people often praise this kind of lack of red tape. It's very easy to set up a business there. It's very quick to move into Singapore. Again, accessibility. Another thing is that I believe Singapore has really progressive immigration policies. Yeah. And I think that has led to really interesting diversity. And then I don't, I don't mean to quote myself on the slide, but <laughs> I think that that kind of cultural diversity really breeds creativity, which eventually turns into innovation. And I think that, I think kind of Tokyo's future really relies on its ability to channel its, its creative people, but also attract creative people. Yeah. And so I think Singapore has done a lot in terms of being able to create a very well integrated and diverse workforce. Nancy, you're, you're nodding. I mean, you, you, you agree with that. You've, as you say, you've just been in Seoul and Beijing. I mean, what are they doing well? Oh, what are Beijing and Seoul doing well? I'm, I'm intrigued by Singapore because I haven't been there, but uh, what strikes me about Singapore is the message is we want the best, we want people who are really driven by success, and we're going to give you also high quality of life, best education, but imagine a place that's putting out a call to the best minds around the world. Now, I'm not sure if that's happening here. I mean, we're coming. Uh, regardless, but it's not really a call that you hear on a regular basis. And Singapore is the global hub of Southeast Asia. Tokyo is that future city, sort of a la Blade Runner, but then you have Mita, and <laughs> where I've lived, I mean, some of these sort of government parts of Tokyo really shut down on the weekend, get very quiet. I taught at Sofia, and it would just be like a ghost town on the, on the weekend. But it, it was also, that was fascinating in itself. And that's a bit of an issue, a challenge for Tokyo in that you have a lot of people who live outside the city center. So then um, we who are left here, <laughs> we're kind of looking around for things to do. And that's how I discovered the garden at uh, the wonderful new Otani. I mean, how can you not? love that, uh, just right in the heart of the city, the outer moat, all the history there. Again, it's the storytelling, the stories that have yet to emerge. Mm. Um, and I, I know that everyone has a personal story, and that's sort of been a big thrust of my research, and uh, that we need to get those stories out. You don't want in city branding, it was mentioned earlier, for it to be too government directed because that is um, having worked for the government we do some things well but there is a credibility issue at times and also uh, authenticity I mean when people just tell their stories on their own sitting across the table from each other that's where we feel like we're getting the closest to the the truth to the uh, the personal experience and that's what we're all seeking in this age of social media and global communications. So, D David, um, you know, again, to this, to this particular point about the, uh, there's, a, there's a resilience, I think, about Tokyo, which is interesting. I mean, it, you know, when we look at some of the things we've obviously all seen and heard about um, globally in the lead up to the Olympics, there's almost that sense of, well, you know what? It's Tokyo. They'll deal with it. That's fine not an issue. If these sorts of things happened in Athens, it might be a slightly different story. <laughs> um, maybe that's a personal point of view. Um, we're not li streaming live to Athens right now, are we? <laughs> but I think that's a, that's a real 
you know, it's a real view, is that sense of uh, an extraordinarily competent um, city and, and able to manage incredibly effectively these sorts of large public, in this instance, sporting and, and, and media events. But maybe I just want to turn to this point around self-esteem. I, I uh, alluded to this fact earlier about, you know, whilst the folks in Sydney are rather keen to talk about themselves, um, people in Tokyo aren't. Now, now, what does that mean in your own view on how, how does that prohibit Tokyo's ability to advance at a time where over the next 15 years it will become an increasingly face com increased competition from cities across Asia? Yeah, I think, well, that's of course a difficult question. I think that the, there's a really fine line between, you know, being modest, yet being able to articulate what you're good at. And I think that um, we see sometimes with our clients, like they're, they're sitting on so much know-how, on so much talent, on so much ability, yet the ability to tell that story is just not there. Mm. And uh, and I would say the confidence to reach out to someone else can help you tell that story sometimes is, what, is what's enough. I think that there's, there's been numerous studies, I feel, in, in the last few years. I think there was Adobe State of Creator, I think, in 2012, which became a little bit famous because in, the, in that study, um, all countries around the world rated other countries for creativity, and Japan emerged at the top of the list. And then um, the survey also asked people from that specific country, in that case, Japan, to rate themselves for creativity. And Japanese people place themselves extremely low in, in the very same list. So there's a huge gap between the potential, the creative potential that Tokyo and Japan has and the confidence to kind of act on that, mm. on that potential. I think sometimes in my company we talk a lot about creative confidence and there's a huge gap between the, the creativity that it's innate to you and the potential you have, but the courage and the bravery really act on that talent and skills. And I think that, um, I really think it's really critical to brand Japan and brand Tokyo to find in some way that confidence to articulate towards the rest of the world why Japan is is what it is. Do you think the, I mean, your own views on that, perhaps particularly around the Cool Japan initiative, um, you, you know, what impact do you think that has the potential to, to, to achieve in as a, as a vehicle for storytelling. Well, before I talk about Cool Japan, I wanted to mention in that same Adobe study that the Americans <laughs> surveyed were overinflating creativity. So it's it's common even in a personal ad or when you're <laughs> on a dating site that you'll say highly creative. I'm a real creative type. It's very individual, and perhaps part of that gap has to do with creative industries. It, again, it goes back to modesty and y you wouldn't, I don't picture a lot of Japanese going around talking about how creative they are. They just are creative. They don't have to say it. <laughs> and so that's the beauty of the differences in people. Um, also, with Cool Japan, I've written a lot about Cool Japan and uh, what I appreciate is last year there was a report from the Cool Japan Advisory Council and I don't know if anybody's seen it, I can send it to you, it was made public. But there was, a, there was the criticism of it not having gained the traction that they were hoping for. One being that they were sort of slow to roll it out. Two being that it's a derivative campaign, it's based on Cool Britannia, which they admit to. And um, three, it's, they, there were some references made to uh, maybe going back to having people help you cultivate your story because there was a mention of Steve Jobs and his love of uh, Zen Buddhism and then there was sort of a leap to well Zen Buddhism has become more popular in the US and there's a link here you can't quite make that direct link his travel to Japan leads to Zen Buddhism popularity in the US in fact, if you do a Google search or go to Amazon.com, we have so many books, the, the Zen of uh, pastry dishes, the Zen of golfing, and so Zen is sort of an overused term now, 
And um, I'm on a, my own campaign to get beyond sushi as an identification with Japan as much as I love it, but I'm very big on soba because soba is less known and <laughs> you can, again, add layers to that storytelling. I don't like when a country is reduced to sort of one food product when you, you have this extraordinary cuisine here. So um, it's, uh, be honest with yourself. If you're gonna do a cool Japan, a lot of the cool Japan fund activities are um, events, maybe opening up pop-up restaurants, and they're not related to a strategic narrative, and you do need that. Well, I'll just come back to the topic of Tokyo now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, from the viewpoint of uh, economic power, uh, we are just calculating the uh, economic, uh, trip, uh, economic uh, um, ripple effect. Until 2020, it can't be about uh, 20 trillion yen. And this is a very huge impact. And this impact make about 0.3% up of GDP, uh, gross uh, uh, domestic product for next five years. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is an important topic for Japan because it's a good chance to invite more foreign investors, investment also. Mm -hmm. Although the Tokyo government has a policy of Asian headquarters special zones, it was formulated in uh, 2011. And uh, it didn't work well, but after this kind of decision of Olympic Games now, it's changing now. It's kind of economic part. And uh, for the other part of the you know, evaluation of uh, Tokyo is, well, this is my impression about that. Of course, we are doing uh, our uh, city ranking by using 70 indicators, but it's only 70. And within 70 indicators, 11 indicators come from surveys from residents or cities. But uh, we can use only 59 indicators. So this kind of the one example to show the power of the city by using 59 indicators, mainly focusing on the urban management and urban infrastructure and building some others. It's a kind of very you know, bias to the hardware the field. And uh, from last two years, we started new new idea of evaluation now. It's kind of uh, uh, more urban management software, as you said today. And we named that, that is urban intangible value. We can touch, but we can find something. This very important issue to find out what's new, what's important in Tokyo now. Of course, we can come to Singapore, come to Seoul, even in uh, Shanghai and in Tokyo. It looks the same because it's already global standard of buildings, and uh, we, can, we cannot easy to find difference. But behind that, maybe for uh, maybe next five, 10 years, we have to understand more about the quality of management. Mm -hmm. That's a starting point for our intangible value. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are using six elements. Uh, these are efficiency, accuracy and the speed, safety and security, hospitality, change and growth, and diversity. So finally, I only say the conclusion. Top, top two cities are Tokyo and Vienna. Okay? But important issue, Tokyo is a kind of very huge city. Vienna, very nice and a compact city. But they have the same taste. It's a new finding so far. Yeah. Of course, we have a fourth position now in Tokyo in GPCI. But from a different viewpoint, Tokyo has something. And a final comment, OK? Please. Now, I'm a member of a uh, uh, task force of uh, global uh, public relations of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Mm -hmm. And after the decision of this Olympic game, TMG just started how we can make more you know, uh, uh, international uh, public relations. It's quite late, but it's OK. It's starting. But still, in this point, people don't know what kind of content is important to foreigners. Of course, we know sushi, we know something, many, but it's quite a limited part. Cool Japan is very cool, yeah. not so open to the world, okay? Yeah. So what's the next? So m my impression now is, of course, we have this kind of GPC ranking, the viewpoint of hardware. At the same time, from this kind of, uh, we call uh, urban intangible bar, UIV, it's a kind of software base. Just combine together and have to show what is Japanese culture, what is Japanese know-how of city management. 
So CD management should be the best in the world, mm -hmm. but uh, even Japan don't know. So th this is an important point for us the next five, 10 years until Olympic Games. But furthermore, after that, uh, maybe they have no time, time to say, but we have more terrible time. After 2025, now all the Japanese population is decreasing. Even in Tokyo region, next 10 years, it starts in decreasing. decreasing. On the other hand, New York and London are just still going up in population. So maybe after next 10 years, it should be a very terrible time for Japan to Tokyo. It, it does seem, it seems to be this commonality <coughs> between cities that host the Olympic Games, that there is a lot of goodwill in most cities following the Olympic Games. Well, I'm interested in your thoughts on what Tokyo needs to do to retain that level of interest after, as you as you get into 2020 and beyond, 2025. Yeah. I mean, what we've heard, I think, is kind of interesting because it suggests that there is a a, a cultural uh, need to almost tell stories, but as a slow reveal, yeah, to, yeah. to, to introduce yeah. ideas, and I think that also perhaps helps reinforce the authenticity of a place rather than big, bold campaigns. That, that doesn't necessarily seem to fit here. But I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on the key, the key things that Tokyo needs to focus on to ensure that the benefits it feels immediately after the games are perhaps the same benefits it feels five years afterwards. Well, uh, maybe so many options, but uh, one thing I have to say is that we have limitation. It's a deadline. We have to, you know, grade up everything by 2025. It's very important. Maybe we should have a first position in the world until that time. Mm. But after that, after maybe 20, 30 years, we have to be quiet. Okay? That's only the one point I was saying. Mm. And one other good point is uh, in 2027, we have a new type of a bar train, of a Maghreb train. It combines Tokyo and Nagoya together. Mm. So Tokyo may have a more power so after that, even for me, I don't know. But until that time, we have to do everything. And this very kind of the time is so limited. It's very an urgent time. We talk about limited time. We're going to have to turn this over to the floor <laughs> <laughs> for in a moment. I, I do just want to ask, I know you're posing to us. But David, I'm, I'm just interested maybe as a, as a final comment from you about this. You know, we've heard this today, this morning about almost from a design perspective, it's as if Tokyo works and it perhaps it shouldn't. Uh, I'm just interested in your views on what you think the, almost the connective tissue is w within Tokyo that does make it work and the impact that that will have on, you know, Tokyo 2025 and, and beyond. And um, I think that that's a really great question. Uh, and, and you're right, when you look at Tokyo from the outside, it's a city that it would be really hard to design and, and make work. Um, I'm going to try to keep it short because I think it would be good maybe to hear the point of view of other people. But uh, for me, it's somewhat obvious that from a pure functional perspective, I think public transportation, just being able to move that many people so efficiently and taking them off of the street from a pure functional perspective is incredible. And of course, it helps that Japanese people have a sort of cultural propensity for punctuality order, so everything works really well, and that really helps. The second thing, um, I would say neighborhood. Uh, we talked a little, I, you know, there was a slide about neighborhoods. I think that's really interesting to me about Tokyo, is that somebody said that Tokyo is a city with no center, or with an empty center. Every neighborhood is a little bit its own city, and that really sort of helps diffuse the pressure from everybody doing the same thing at the same time in the same place. There is a there is a cultural diversity. There's opportunity to engage with Tokyo in different ways. And maybe the, the third one is, is people. I think everybody talks and knows about Japanese hospitality. And that in itself uh, makes the city a lot more of a pleasant place yeah. to, to live. There's, there's, less, there's less conflict. There's less stress on the street. Yeah. I'm I going don't know if anybody. Well, I'm what I'm going to do now, because I can feel someone's about to hit me on the back of the head. <laughs> 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 uh, if you do have comments on that, maybe we can include those in response to, to any questions. So, uh, yes, so thank you so far. First of all, thank you, panel, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, 
uh, we don't have much time, but we would like to open up the floor for questions. Please do stand when you ask a question and state your name and your affiliation. Keep the question nice and clear cut and simple, and uh, we'll get started with Joy. Hi, my name is Joy with Custom Media, and I have a question uh, in terms of clarity. Often the statements were being answered with Tokyo, Japan, Japanese. So what is the challenge of Tokyo making a statement for a nation? For example, as in Great Britain was talking about a national identity, Singapore is a nation state. So in terms of Tokyo, where is that boundary? And perhaps in relation to its other neighbors, Kobe, Osaka, Nagoya, how much soft power buy-in do they have to have from their neighbors in order for this to succeed? You know, I don't know who here has been to Israel, but if you want to do a little comparison, Tel Aviv is branded, we call it place branding. Tel Aviv is sort of a, a brand in the minds of many people that is not associated with Israel because Israel carries a very different set of attributes, much more politically polarizing. With Tokyo, fascinating, I can just tell it in terms of a story. I went to give a talk in Fukui, Japan, and at a regional university to strictly Japanese students, and I thought that the wow factor was that I was from the United States. No, they were so intrigued that I lived in Tokyo, and many of them had never been to Tokyo, and they, they just were overwhelmed by the thought of visiting Tokyo. Japanese saying this, so Tokyo is always gonna be the dominant brand here. Many people who talk to me, and I post a lot on Instagram and Facebook, and they talk to me in terms of Tokyo. It just seems to be a more manageable, ironically, <laughs> data bit for them to handle. Then from there, you use Tokyo as a gateway to the rest of Japan, because we all know how much more there is to Japan than just Tokyo. But Tokyo will dominate. That, that's what it's all about. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think that's a really great question. I'd love to see Japan put forward a little bit more made in Japan. I think that is such a powerful message. If you think, I actually think that that's a big advantage that the third economy of the world as against the second economy of the world. I want, you know, if you say made in China as opposed to made in Japan, I think Japan is a great advantage there. I think a, a good example, um, actually I think Italy is a really good example and not because that's where I'm originally from. But if you think about Italy as a brand of a country, it's a collection of cities that are very different. None of them are dominant, but all of them are interesting in very mm. different way. And I think Japan has, has very much the same opportunity to really push up some of its city and some of its culture. And I think a lot of those soft, soft power attributes actually come from Japan as a country, not so much from Tokyo as a city. I'll, I'll make one comment if I can on this, because I think in some regards, this is a question about diversity, about the, the, the power and impact of diversity. And when we talk about the importance that we attribute to neighborhoods, what neighborhoods do is they, 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 tell, they tell the stories, as David said, they're almost mini cities they create a perception of the diversity of the experience. At a national level, the same rules apply, if you will. And so there is almost a, a responsibility, if you want to call it that, at a national level to tell a story of diversity. That, I think, is what the Great Britain campaign did well. Um, likewise, Tokyo's story, it appears, so far, is, is one that does tell that story of, of diversity, however limited that might be. Clearly, diversity has a number of different meanings, but I would suggest to that particular question that there is a, a common strategic thread that runs through a national campaign and a city campaign in the way in which they tell their stories, and diversity is an important part of that. Thank you very much. Okay, shall we have another question, please? Raise your hand. All right, in the back there. And please do remember that this is uh, on the record. Everything is on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Diana Green. I'm from Vision Lead. Um, I was just referring, as you were speaking, about the changes that have happened in Japan over a period of time and specific to Tokyo. <coughs> my first experience was 30 years ago here, and I, don't, I wasn't living here, I was coming in and out for work. But one of the things uh, that struck me 
originally was Japan itself, products and services, particularly products, were regarded as inferior. And then government got behind that. And then on the catwalk in Paris, Miyake, Comme des Garçons, etc. So I'm wondering whether the Tokyo brand has some uh, possibility to look at its history and how it did things to perhaps mirror it or step on from that as a potential, because it was successful in that. Mm. And they became global. And I think there's some merit that hasn't been considered about its own ability to be Japanese rather than Westerners explaining to Japanese but having the Japanese tell us. Because I think it has done it before. So that's all I wanted to say. Well, well. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. But it's very difficult to uh, answer the important point about that. Uh, maybe related to the first uh, person to ask about the case of Tokyo now. Well, of course, we need Tokyo brand. And uh, already Tokyo brand is very famous in, in Japan. But uh, also we have to understand whenever we say Tokyo, other areas, people complain that, envy, deny, criticism. So finally, Japanese government tried to make Tokyo make down. I mean, just be, be, Tokyo should be quiet, okay? This is Japanese policy. It's, it's very funny. So whenever we do something to the world, the person, well, personally, we have to do private companies or people, we have so many, you know, international companies such as Sony and some others, but they don't have any you know, help from government. They buy themselves. So maybe your question might be the same to this kind of stream. <laughs> well, not government, not Tokyo government, not Japanese government. Someone should do that. Someone should understand what's important need to the world. Then we have to say. But this might be important to make more business. Of course, yes. So it's up to the you know, person, personal point, private sectors not government, and still are struggling. Even for our GPCI, it's done by foundation. It's not the government. It's kind of quite Japanese style. Mm. So finally, you have to catch up some others, but I, I'm afraid that it takes time. Mm. That's my question. Mm. Uh, I, I was referring it more from that was an example of something that came to pass. As it turns out, it was initiated through, I think, textile schools, the government got behind that. But the outcome was the individuals, such as Izumiaki, for example, who took it on and made it something. And I think that is an example. So it was only for a reference to exemplifying that it has been done, how it's done or who gets behind it is something that Japanese people in Tokyo uh, have a voice to, to share. And I think that's part of the, the merit of Tokyo becoming whole is for, for Tokyo residents and people to get involved and express what it is that they think is Tokyo as well. Thank I'll you. add yeah, please I'll go ahead. one final, yeah. final point on, on that, because I think it's, it's a good question, it's an interesting question. In many regards, um, Japan um, is at a, uh, almost at a, a tipping point, I think, point where there is a recognition of economic resurgence, there is a uh, recognition of a city in Tokyo uh, that is about to take on the Olympic Games and interest in that. Um, there is a sense of um, competition, I mean, particularly if we think in the technology space, which um, Japan has originally, historically, to your point, has been so strong, where um, whether it's from uh, South Korea, China, or, or other markets, there is a, an aspiration to reclaim uh, uh, their competitive place, for particularly for consumer brands. So when you have consumer brands looking for an opportunity to go strong and bold, when you have economic resurgence, and when you have uh, the spotlight of the world about to come very fast and hard onto you, it, it strikes me that there is a, an a extraordinary opportunity for those forces to connect. For, as I, I said earlier, and I forgive me for laboring the point, but the role that brands play in the stories they can tell, just to your point about the roles that people play in the stories you can tell, I think is incredibly important and there's a huge opportunity for this city. Right? 
But I would also add to that beyond brands is important. And uh, Kingo Kuma, I think, did an interview with Custom Media, and it was so tri striking because he talked about the sensibility of the design person in looking at the past and bringing it forward in Japanese design. And I would say listen to these architects also, the films, the, the incredible Japanese directors who were admired the world over, uh, those are stories that have gone around the world. Brand is a very mixed concept. There are some people who are a little repelled by it because it's too much commercialism. It's too much sort of manufacturing. And it goes back to that point about authenticity. And so um, I would recommend that video. I think that's an ACCJ okay. <laughs> video. Well, thank you so much. I think we've been so encouraged by all your words today. And I think all of us feel a lot of hope for Tokyo as a global brand. Thank you so much. Let's give a big round of applause to our panel and to Ian. And we would like to have a final word from John Kushner. So please take the stage. Thank you, everyone. Uh, John Kushner, Vice President uh, at the Chamber and uh, Managing Partner with Cray up here. I want to thank uh, the panelists, uh, Ian, uh, Dr. Ichikawa, uh, David, thank you, and, and Nancy. Uh, fabulous presentation today. Uh, very interesting dialogue. I wish we had more time uh, for discussion because there's clearly a lot of energy and interest in the room in the topic um, as we all look ahead, uh, not only to 2020, but beyond 2020. And I think we all do sense Ian, I think you, you said it very well uh, in your closing remarks that we are at a very interesting point, and I kind of almost think of it as an, as an inflection point for Japan, um, and it is about brands and how brands enable uh, that conversation, and, and for, for Tokyo, for Japan, uh, for a lot of the companies uh, that are here, it all comes down to the people and the stories that they tell. So if we can all get uh, uh, understanding and clarity a little bit about what that story is going to be, and that story will probably develop a little bit organically. Um, we at the Chamber certainly want to be part of that message. Uh, we have a, a committee here at the Chamber that we created just recently called the uh, Olympic and Sport Business Committee, uh, of which I chair together uh, with uh, Mr. Jenkins over there. Thank you very much. And uh, we are looking forward to working uh, with uh, the members across uh, the, uh, the Chamber, as well as with the government at various levels and companies to really enable Tokyo and Japan to be its best for 2020 and beyond. So thank you very much, everyone. And in true ACCJ spirit, we have a token of appreciation for all of our guests. Jay, if you wouldn't mind coming up here. Thank you. Okay, okay. so first uh, uh, we have a certificate of appreciation for you, Ian. Thank you. And Dr. Ichikawa, thank you. David Agnelli. And certainly last but not least, our most modest speaker, Dr. Nancy Snow. Thank you. Thank you very much. This adjourns the program for today.